With the Manor Lords release just around the corner, I've been playing this game to death with over 40 hours played as of the time of recording and probably double that by the time this video goes live. And as you'll know, if you watched my first Manor Lords video, I was going to save all of my tips and tricks and guides for the release date itself and just continue with my Let's Play series to give you a feel for the game without spoiling too much and trying to dictate the way you play. But it seems that unfortunately people really didn't care for my Let's Play series. So in an effort to keep the Manor Lords content flowing and stick with my original plan, I have decided to release my first tips video early. Therefore, here is my top 25 tips that you should know as you're taking your very first steps into the world of Manor Lords to help you and your town succeed and not fall flat at the first admittedly very tough hurdle as you watch all of your villagers starve and freeze to death. So without further ado, let's jump into tip number one. In an effort to make this video as chronological yet comprehensive as possible, these 25 tips will be roughly in the order in which you encounter these things in the game. The first third of the video will be mainly focusing on the early game, the middle third, the mid game, and obviously the last few tips are more focused around the late game. So firstly, every single system and mechanic in this game has been so well thought out that everything you do really truly matters down to the most tiny minute details. And in that vein, tip one is to make sure that your families live close to their places of work. And this is because villagers, aside from fulfilling their basic needs, will work every available hour. So the less time they have commuting to their place of work, the more time they will spend working. Capitalism, baby. And to this end, it is very easy for you to check who is working at each workplace and vice versa if looking at the villagers' homes where that family works. And using these two pieces of information, you can very easily reassign workplaces whenever you want. So the next time you've just plonked down a load of new houses and you've set up a bunch more workplaces to go along with them, just spend a few minutes pausing your game and checking where everyone is working and where these people live to make sure they're all living and working in the most efficient places possible. And on that same thought, tip two is quite similar. The distance from the market is also important. The marketplace is the lifeblood and the hub of all villages and towns. These are needed to fill villagers' needs. Everything from food and clothing to entertainment. And again, the closer proximity a house has to a market, the quicker villagers' needs will be met and the more efficient and happier they will be. Efficiency is obviously very important to keep all of your production going, but happiness is equally as important because not only will meeting villagers' needs allow you to upgrade your houses quicker and unlock new development options, but it will also improve your overall approval rating, which is needed to attract new families. And for this reason, tip number three is to have multiple small markets scattered around so that each group of houses can quickly and easily fulfill all of their needs from their nearest marketplace. One often neglected and very critical structure is your hitching post, which can be upgraded to a stable. These posts, along with the oxen that you can hire for them, are needed to transport around all of your goods, materials and resources. For that reason, it's a very good idea to build a second hitching post early on. Have one close to your main source of lumber, firewood and other uses for your trees and another one close to your food sources such as your hunting camp and your berry bushes. This again is another tip that's going to minimize downtime and help keep all of your production flowing nice and smoothly. The next few tips are about buildings and building placement. Tip 5 is to be very careful where you place new buildings, especially if they are in forests. Quite a few resources are in amongst forests, be that clay or iron deposits, animals, berry bushes, basically anything honestly. And depending on where you place your buildings, you can uproot and lose trees. And by uprooting trees in this way, you will completely lose the timber which you otherwise would have been able to gather. So use the ability to rotate your buildings to fit it in perfectly in such a way that you minimalize your losses of trees. 
However, if you do lose too many trees and you find you're running low and the likes of your logging camp are no longer operating at full efficiency, there is a fantastic combo you can do with just two buildings. The logging camp, which you need to gather timber to build most buildings, and the forester hut, which will actually replenish trees in the nearby area. You can move these buildings around, along with many other buildings, as many times as you want. So when a logging camp has pretty much exhausted all of the trees in that area, just shift it to a new area and put a forester hut where it was. This way, in just a few seasons, all of the trees will be back, and once your logging camp has exhausted all of the trees in the new area, just put it back again. This way, just cycling through two or three different areas will give you an infinite amount of trees. However, for tip number seven, be careful because each time you do this, if there was any firewood, timber, planks, or any other form of trees in these buildings when you moved them, the resources will be left behind. And currently, at least in the early access version of the game, there is no way to prioritize the collection of these resources. Which means if you are doing this maneuvering around of your buildings during certain seasons with particularly bad weather, all of these resources can be affected by the elements and will go bad and become unusable. So be careful when moving or demolishing your buildings. Just check if there's anything in there first and try and get your oxen and your other unassigned families to move these buildings out somewhere else first. And that leads me on perfectly to tip number eight, to make sure you upgrade your storehouse as soon as possible. This is where you will store pretty much every single one of your materials. Food is separate, that's stored in the granary. I have never once seen my granary get full because pretty much all of your food goes to market straight away. But everything else, your iron, your roof tiles, your wood, your firewood, your timber, literally every other material is stored in the storehouse and this can get full very quickly. So upgrade that as soon as you can to make sure that all your resources aren't being left out all over the place going bad from the bad weather. Tip number nine is to always make sure you have at least one unassigned family. I mentioned this briefly earlier, only unassigned families will build buildings and you will get a big old warning if you don't have one and you do have a structure currently needing to be built. So don't worry if you forget, the game's very good at letting you know. But ideally, especially when your town starts to get a bit bigger, like 30 families plus, try to always have two to three unassigned. Because you will eventually start to find that you're needing to build multiple buildings at once and just one unassigned family won't cut it. However, don't worry, because it's very, very easy to swap people around loads and loads depending on what's currently needed. So if you find that you're hunting too many animals and the animal population in your region is getting a bit thin, just unassign a family from your hunting camp and they're now unassigned and ready to build some buildings for you. Also, certain resources are seasonal, so you can actually only harvest berries during certain seasons anyway. So unassign them, that's an extra family ready and waiting to build anything that you need building. Next up, I mentioned in my Let's Play video that quite a few buildings in this game have flexible plots. This means you can build them any shape or size you want, and it's really, really fun to do. But this isn't just purely cosmetic, and because it's fun, it has a genuine gameplay effect. One example of this is the size of your burgages. A burgage is a house for your family, and depending on the length, you can add a backyard extension on the back of this burgage, which will then allow this family to do something additional when they're at home, such as breeding chickens or growing vegetables. And tip number 10 specifically is around the usage of vegetable farms. You want long, skinny plots if you want an effective and efficient vegetable farm at the back of one of your houses. So try and make the backyard extension roughly two times the size of the burgage itself. This seems to be a really good sweet spot for a vegetable patch. And on the flip side, for tip number 11, if you want the extension to be chickens for eggs or goats for hides, they don't seem to care about the plot size, so you can make these houses as tiny as possible for a constant supply of eggs and hides. Tip number 12, when you start to get into farming and you get round to planting a few different farms, not only do you want to keep an eye on the ground fertility to make sure that you are harvesting the most efficient crop, 
but also keep in mind that crops harvest in autumn. Months have a huge impact in this game. And as you can see down the bottom right here, there is a really good key of exactly when the months run from and to, and the gameplay impact of each of the months. Winter particularly can be very harsh, shutting down quite a few gathering facilities and doubling your firewood usage. So keep an eye on your farms and your other seasonal structures in relation to the current month of the year. Tip number 13, I did consider putting this early in the video because this is one that applies throughout the entire game. But when your town is really small, this isn't needed as much. So I felt like this is more of a mid-game tip. If you hold tab, you can see a ton of additional information for all of your buildings. If we take Burgages for an example, you can see things such as their happiness requirements and whether they are missing an additional food type or if they're not getting enough firewood or clothing. You can also see if they're ready to upgrade or if they have yet to have a backyard extension built. There is so much information when you hold tab. The thing I use it for primarily is once every few minutes, I'll hold tab and I'll scan over my whole entire town and make sure that I don't have any gathering or production structures without any families assigned. And if I do, I'll go and double check. Oh, okay, it's the winter. That's why I've got no foragers because berry bushes don't grow in the winter. And if you keep on top of this and get used to all of the information that tab has to show you, your village management becomes 10 times easier. Next up, following on from tip number four, as your village gets bigger, make sure that you keep adding additional hitching posts. You will find this can and will be the biggest bottleneck for your town if you are forgetting to hire additional oxen, assign families, and upgrade your posts to stables so that you can have multiple families and multiple oxen per post. Do not neglect them. This is one of your most important structures. Everything will grind to a halt if you don't have enough people and animals ferrying your goods and materials around. Tip number 15. Every time you fulfill the requirements to upgrade your village, you'll start at a small village, you'll progress to a medium, then a large, then a small town, etc, etc. You will do this six times, which gives you a maximum of six development points per region. These are kind of like talent points or skill points. They have a really big effect on the game, but they only affect that region. Every new region you populate will start with zero development points, and as you level them up, you will unlock them just like you did in your first main starter region. So, the primary point I want to drill home for this tip is to spend them wisely and not try to spread yourself too thin. For instance, I advise not putting a single development point in farming in your first region because farming takes years and is very expensive and requires a lot of families to do this. So ideally, you need a region that is able to fully specialize in farming and unlock pretty much every single development point in farming. But there are far more important pressing things you want to grab for your first region, such as making exporting and importing trade goods more efficient. That should be a much bigger priority for your first region. And if you've already specialized in that, then you're going to spread yourself too thin if you're also trying to specialize in farming. So have in mind, based on the resources in each region and which ones are rich and which ones are normal, what you want each region to focus on and have your development points reflect that. As we have just touched on exploring and settling new regions, to do this, you need influence. So the next few tips will be focused around influence and how to gain it. Once you have built a manor, which is your main administration building, you will then be able to tithe a portion of your food as income for the church, which will generate influence. In the early game, this will only give you very small amounts of influence. As you see, my influence has only increased a tiny portion here when tithing a small percentage of my food. But when you have got thousands of food stored up and you can afford to bump that tithe up to 40 or 50 percent perhaps you will be gaining hundreds of influence which will help you to expand rapidly and do other really cool things in the future as well another one-off way of gaining influence is through upgrading your town and upgrading your church 
only your first church for each region will count, and it will give you an injection of 250 influence. And again, each time you develop your village or your town to the next level and gain a development point, you will also get a one-off injection of influence. And primarily, this influence is needed to settle new regions and contest regions of your opponents. However, for tip number 18, definitely the biggest and best, and in my opinion, the most fun way to gain huge amounts of influence is through combat. Defeating waves of bandits and destroying bandit camps will net you lots of money either for your treasury or for your regional income, and more importantly, loads of influence. As an example, as you see here in this fight, this is a very early game, very easy fight, and I've just hired a few cheap mercenaries to help fend off these four groups of bandits. Just four groups of 16 very low-level bandits, very easy to defeat and very weak. Yet, by the end of this fight, my influence is now two and a half thousand. And as you can see, it was less than a thousand before we started this fight. So just by fending off a few bandits, in this very easy engagement, losing practically no units in the meantime, and having a bit of fun, I've now got enough influence to claim two more regions. Next up, we really need to talk about how you can start making some serious money. You will need regional income for a lot of different purposes in this game, and then you can then convert that into your treasury, but we'll talk about that in a later tip. Firstly, let's talk about making money and making regional income so that you can start purchasing upgrades for your burgages, setting up new trade routes, and so much more. One of the best ways to do this is to set up a trade route for war bows. You can make war bows very easily by upgrading a burgage to level 2 and equipping the correct backyard extension. Now, with just a few planks, you will be able to make so many war bows, which sell for tons of money at the trading post. You can then use all of the regional income that you'll be getting to set up so many more trade routes. Now, I do imagine that this will be nerfed slightly by the final version, because this is truly very overpowered at the moment. But I firmly believe that this information will still apply to the final version of the game. Because at the end of the day, both in reality and in games, war can be very profitable for the right parties. And selling your excess weapons and armor is definitely a fantastic way to capitalize on this. For tip number 20, let's talk about combat again. I mentioned it briefly earlier, but let me be specific because this will really help you out. Using your villagers, using your own population, and raising them as militia to then use in combat will remove them from your workforce for the duration that they are rallied and out on excursions. So for the most part, try to use mostly mercenaries. Mercenaries require a one-time fee to hire, and then an ongoing monthly fee as well. But if you have utilized my other tips, you will have so much treasury that it will be very easy for you to maintain a few groups of mercenaries and stick them in the central region, ready to attack any bandits or other enemy forces that may pop up. Also, the developer is currently toying with a few ways that mercenaries could work, and at the moment, when a mercenary band has been hired by someone, they are then removed from the pool for the other player or players, AI or otherwise. So if you are playing against the Baron, like I am on this map here, leave it too late and the Baron will hire most of the mercenaries themselves, and then you'll be pretty screwed when you're trying to fight back your enemies in the future. Tip number 21, do not double click to move your army as it will force them to sprint and it will exhaust them. Your troops have both morale and exhaustion and these two attributes combined make up their effectiveness, which is basically how good they are in combat, how much damage they take, how quickly morale affects them, how much damage they deal. So make sure you are walking them to every destination by just using a single right click to move them unless obviously there is an exception where you do need to sprint them back to defend one of your towns. And you can check that with the second furthest icon on the right, the little man running, because it will be highlighted if they are currently running to their destination. So just click that again and it will turn it off. 
I've already spoken briefly about both taxation and raising armies. Tip number 22 is to make sure that you go to your manor and set a decent taxation level well in advance of whenever you think you may need to start using your treasury. High levels of taxation cause a huge negative impact on your approval levels. And with low approval, specifically 50% or lower, you will no longer have new families wanting to join your towns and villages. So make sure you start off by setting your taxation levels low at around 10 or 15% so they don't cause too much of a negative impact on your approval rating whilst still allowing you to build up your treasury so that you can hire mercenaries and do other juicy late game activities. Tip number 23 is about the high ground. As Star Wars taught us, the high ground truly does matter. It's over Anakin! I have the high ground! underestimate my power. Don't try it. So firstly, talking of the high ground, let's take a look at windmills. As you can see here, if I lower my camera, you can very clearly see the difference in the elevation of terrain. And depending on where I move my windmill, this can drastically affect its efficiency. Likewise, as the description says, windmills do not like to be boxed in with trees and other buildings, so find them a nice, high, open space so they can work at maximum efficiency. And also, when we're talking about the high ground, just like in reality, troops, especially ranged soldiers, much prefer the high ground. So try to keep elevation in mind when deciding where to attack your enemies and make sure your archers are positioned accordingly. 24 is a bit of a silly one, but just for anyone that didn't know, you can change the sound of your church bell. So spend a minute or two flicking through the sounds, seeing whichever one is your favorite, and always make sure that one of the first things you do in your playthrough, as soon as you get a church, is pick your favorite church bell so that you can have a little chuckle to yourself every time you hear that cowbell sound go off. And tip number 25, as we've spoken about burgages and backyard extension plots quite a lot throughout this video, tip number 25 is to make sure that you upgrade at least a few level 2 burgages early on. Do not neglect the additional plots that you will unlock from level 2 housing. You cannot live very long in this game with the bare essentials. Making proper clothing, being able to brew ale, making weapons, these are all very, very valuable if you want to survive past the first two to three years. So upgrade a few houses to level two as soon as you can, get familiar with them, and make sure pretty much all of your houses have the ability for a backyard plot. And with that, my friends, you should now be well equipped to deal with every single thing that Mana Lords has to throw at you. However, please let me know in the comments if there's anything else you'd like any further clarification on, any game systems that I seemingly haven't touched on at all, and I'd be more than happy to make a follow-up advanced tips video. But for now, all that's left for me to say is thank you so much for watching. I hope you have an amazing day, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.